Welcome back. Our afternoon panel is a consideration of the topic of security and civil rights. Um, and before we dive right into that, Ted? Yes, of course. Can you tell us about this seat? Okay. Yes, this seat has a plaque on it that says Justice Jackson, 33rd degree. Uh, so Mr. Shaw's question is what's with this seat? This place was originally a mansion belonging to the Kent family and this was their carriage house. And then it passed to the ownership of the Masons, the Scottish Rite Consistory of Masons. And Robert H. Jackson was a Mason and a member of this consistory. And over the years in Masonic activities, he rose to the highest rank, which is the 33rd degree. Someone once sent him a congratulatory letter on being named a 33rd degree Mason, and he kind of poo-pooed it, and he said, it's one of those things that means a lot to the people who believe it means a lot. Um, there's a group photo of the Masons meeting here in the Jackson Center, with Jackson seated in that seat. Um, that's on display toward the front of the building. It's a 1950s photograph. And I think sometime after he passed away, they put a plaque on the seat uh, to indicate. Um, so, no, that, that's a good question. Um, I wanted to put in a quick word for another Jackson topic, which is debate. Um, I have to confess that I did a lot of debating in high school and college. Uh, and one of the things that drew my interest pretty early on was when I discovered that Robert H. Jackson had been a debater at Frewsburg High School and here at Jamestown High School. Um, and so here's the segue. Uh, years ago, uh, I, in college, had, you know, adversaries who were friends on the debate circuit, and one of them was Joyce White, uh, who was a debater at Bates College in Maine, uh, and a really smart and good person, and so forth, and you know, you kind of lose track of people. So that's one side of my memory. And my awareness as a lawyer over these ensuing 30 years was that the U.S. Attorney in the Northern District of Alabama, Joyce Vance, was this very well regarded, nationally renowned powerhouse, etc. So we're putting together this program, and an intermediary said, uh, You got to invite Joyce Vance. And I said, I'd love to, but she's in Alabama, blah, 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 Jamestown. And, and he said, well, she knows you. And I said, she knows me? He said, yeah, like you went to high school or you debated together or something. And now I went to an all-boys high school. <laughs> my, my partner, Jim, never used the name Joyce. You know, I, so like, I, and, and then he said, Joyce White Vance, ka-ching. Um, so that led to this invitation and this wonderful acceptance. Um, Joyce uh, is a graduate of UVA Law School and after some time in private practice went into public service and rose up through the Department of Justice to be uh, a very high level experienced prosecutor uh, and then in 2009 was appointed by President Obama to be the U.S. Attorney in that district uh, and served for the eight years, uh, retired an odd word to use for a young person, but retired from that position uh, at the end of the Obama administration, and now is, uh, to the great benefit of the University of Alabama, uh, a member of its law school faculty and going to be building a center there. So Joyce will be our first speaker. She'll be followed by Margot Schlanger, professor from the University of Michigan Law School, um, a very, very well-regarded leading scholar in fields of immigration and civil rights, also a former uh, public servant in the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Um, as with this morning, the format will be that each of them will speak, uh, and then there will be a chance for audience question, and we'll even do that in two parts. There'll be a little bit of a Joyce and Margot uh, sec section, and then I'm going to ask Lucas and Rick also to come back up, and the last part of the questioning will be a free-for-all with everybody. Um, so no further ado, uh, my old friend, thank you, Joyce Vance. So I can't believe John gave me up like that, knowing that I can tell plenty of stories. <laughs> it's my uh, enormous misfortune to follow Ted Shaw in speaking, a fate I would not wish on my worst enemy. Um, and I hope that perhaps what I can do uh, in some small way is to offer you a little sense of the view on the ground. Because we've heard this morning 
about the legal view and the developments in legal doctrinal practices that surround immigration. And we've heard a very personal, in many ways, um, story about how this becomes part of the American experience and how we let all of these different ideas come to fruition in our minds during very troubled times. My experience leaving government, frankly, has been a difficult one because I resigned just moments before the inauguration of President Trump, um, words I still have some difficulty saying, and yet I continue to believe in the mission of the Justice Department and that we are combined as one America, and essentially when you're on an airplane, you've got to find some way to root for the pilot. So I hope that the work of the Justice Department over the next eight years, despite some concerns about leadership and a shaky start, will at the end of the day be part of the work that keeps us grounded in our values. So, so let me tell you a little bit about United States attorneys, because really we're very much um, behind the scenes. People don't know a lot about U.S. attorneys until we get fired. And so it wasn't until the George W. Bush administration when nine U.S. attorneys were fired for political reasons that most people even knew we existed. And, and again, recently we've seen Trump fire the 41 remaining Obama U.S. attorneys, and again there was a little bit of interest. Um, but let me talk with you a little bit about who we are and what we do. We've existed since the beginning of this country in all judicial districts. Currently there are 93 U.S. attorneys um, at any given time. This is trivia if you're ever on, on Jeopardy. There are actually 94 federal judicial districts, but Guam and the Mariana Islands share a U.S. attorney, so 93 of us. And it is so appropriate to talk about U.S. attorneys and their role in community protection and civil rights in the Jackson Center, because before he was Justice Jackson, he was Attorney General Jackson. And he held that role in the 1940s when it was still a wild west for U.S. attorneys. They were free agents. Uh, the interpretation of the law in California could be very different from the interpretation in Maine. And there were wildly different penalties and approaches across the country. And he sought to herd the cats, to pull all those powerful independent U.S. attorneys together and to create some degree of national uniformity of purpose, of prosecution, of guideline, and to do that, he summoned all of the U.S. attorneys to Washington, D.C. And he spoke to them as a group about shared values and the need for them to surrender not too much, but some of their independence so that we could work together better as a group to ensure that justice in Oklahoma was the same as justice in Florida. That's a bit of the ongoing work of the department, but so appropriate for me to talk about this here by statute, U.S. attorneys have only three jobs. We enforce the criminal laws of the United States. We represent the United States in civil cases, cases involving money or other non-criminal aspects. And we collect money judgments on behalf of the United States. And that role has stayed fairly static um, over time. United States attorneys are not the president's lawyers. They are the people's lawyers. And the first time Barack Obama met with the U.S. attorneys uh, as a group in Washington, he said words that have forever stayed with me. And I wrote them down at the time because I was so fascinated. I actually wrote them down on a cocktail napkin um, that was in my purse. We were at the White House. And I learned later that virtually all of my colleagues had done the same thing. He said to us, I appointed you, but you don't serve me. You serve the American people. And I expect you to do that with integrity and with independence. And those were the words that stayed in our minds throughout our service. And we were in many ways a radical generation of United States attorneys because we worked for a radical boss, Eric Holder. When Eric hired me, when I was in his office for my interview and I said, you know, this is great, I'm really excited, what do you want me to do? And I had my notepad out, I thought it would be a laundry list. And Holder said, just do the right thing. And that was always the guidance that we got from him. So traditionally in the Justice Department, the metric for our work, and I'm a career prosecutor. I started as a line prosecutor, spent 10 years in the criminal division, worked in our appellate division, was the appellate chief um, for the last few years before I became U.S. attorney. 
And our metric was numbers. How many cases are you doing? I actually got a report that showed me how many cases I was indicting and what other people were indicting. And I always thought it was a little bit of a silly metric, but that really came home to me when we started working with Holder, who explicitly rejected the metric that as offices we should be evaluated based on whether we did more cases this year than we did last year. And instead, he suggested a different metric that I was only too happy to adopt. That metric was, is the work that you're doing as a U.S. attorney, is the work that in Birmingham your 54 prosecutors are doing, is that work making your community safer? And that question became the touchstone for evaluating what we did and what we didn't do. Because you have limited resources, there is a lot of crime writ large and then a lot of technical crime, and as U.S. attorney you have to determine where will you focus the relatively few resources you have. What should be a federal crime? What should be prosecuted? And what might not be behavior you would want to encourage, but behavior that you're simply not going to attack because you have other priorities? At the end of the day, you know, my assessment was I was not in the business of producing a widget, and I should not measure my production like a factory would. My product was justice. And so that was the approach that we took in Birmingham, um, something that I'm still very proud of. So it's an interesting balancing act, because nothing that you do as a prosecutor, and I suspect in life, really happens in a vacuum, right? It's not just absolutely I'm going to keep my community safe. You have to do a little bit of a balancing act, because I can certainly keep my community very safe. But that would force me to do things that are contrary to my understanding of my obligations under the Constitution and to the civil rights law in this country. And so anytime you hear law enforcement talking about safety, there's also this balance of rights. And prosecution is, I think, in many ways, art as much as it is science. And much of the art involves how do you balance these priorities that sometimes compete my experience was that if you were doing it right, really they complemented each other, and they didn't have to be in competition. But that took, I think, some willingness to expand your views. Because as a young prosecutor, I was taught, and I'm confident every prosecutor in my generation was taught, that the way you kept the community safe was by arresting bad guys and locking them up for as long as you possibly could. And the data simply doesn't support that. Long sentences aren't the best way to make communities safe. And in many cases, we have over-criminalized and over-incarcerated whole generations of people in disparate ways. By that, I mean that in the wealthy white suburbs of Birmingham, drug crime might go unnoticed, while in predominantly African-American North Birmingham, it might result in lengthy sentencing. And so many of these considerations have to come together um, in the hands of folks when they're trying to think about prosecution. The, the last thing I'll say about U.S. attorneys before I talk a little bit about immigration, which I know is why we're here today, is that when you have leadership in the Justice Department that sets as its goal prosecuting lots of cases and fighting a war on a specific species of crime, prosecutors will try to get numbers of cases, and that means that they will pick low-hanging fruit. They will do the easiest cases. They will do the most accessible cases. They won't do the lengthy cases that take more time and more effort. So it's easy to do a low-level drug case or a felon in possession of a firearm case, which is a federal crime. It's much more difficult to go after a convoluted, lengthy investigation into financial fraud by a public figure. And what we really want in our justice system is a set of incentives that say we protect our community the best when we do the most important cases and we do them with a strong consciousness of people's civil rights. So what did that look like on the ground for us in Alabama? We did some things that were radically different. Prosecutors love to tell you that they are not social workers. And we're not. We don't have that training. We really don't know how to effectively work on behalf of victims or of witnesses, and there are folks who do that much better than we do it. But that simple statement, we're not social workers, had become an excuse. 
And we learned in so many ways that as much as our core responsibility was the enforcement part of the criminal justice system, we also had to work on prevention. We also had to work on, on behalf of people reentering the community from prison to help reduce the barriers that led them to reoffend if we were really going to keep our communities safe. And immigration became a fulcrum for much of the work that we did for the very simple reason that when you talk about people wanting to do numbers of cases and do numbers of cases that are perhaps easier and simpler to do, there was no better statute than the law that made it illegal for someone to re-enter this country after being deported. It's a very simple statute. If you've previously been deported, it's a federal felony to re-enter the country without the permission of the Attorney General. Virtually no one who's crossing the border illegally has that permission, probably no one. And so anytime any of these folks somehow or another became entangled with police authorities, they were referred to us through ICE for prosecution. And there were large numbers of cases along those lines done during the Bush administration. They were problematic for me and for many of my colleagues, and I put an immediate end to doing those cases willy-nilly in Birmingham because I thought that our obligation was to protect the community, and that meant focusing our resources on people who were in this country without status who were violent. We had a number of cases of people who had that kind of history, people with murders, with rapes, with armed robberies in their background. And we often didn't prosecute those cases because we had made no effort to prioritize. We just did whatever came in the door first. They were all the same to us. And so it became important for me to think about doing those cases as part of an overall community strategy for making us safer. And that made it clear that we had to do what was often the more difficult cases, but the cases that made us safer, and at the same time didn't do injustice to our sense of what needed to be done. I will tell you that you will sometimes hear folks criticizing the Obama administration for failing to enforce the law. And the reality is this. There are a lot of laws on the books that we do not enforce most of them in Alabama, which is known for silly laws about dancing with your dog on a Sunday night. Um, but the reality is that prosecutors are in the business of selectively enforcing the law. We have limited resources. Congress gives us money, they gives up, give us numbers of prosecutors, and we have to pick and choose. And it was, I think, a smart choice on criminal side immigration law to um, work in this way. But the much more interesting part of our immigration work happened outside of the criminal realm. And I'll just talk with you briefly about two experiences that I had. Alabama, you may be surprised to learn, has a relatively large Muslim immigrant population. In Tuscaloosa and in Birmingham, the universities have brought in diverse communities, uh, multi-ethnic communities, and communities that primarily were not in touch with law enforcement. Uh, many of them American citizens, many not citizens, permanent residents, not everyone in the community here with legal status. And early in the Obama administration, we identified a gap in civil rights protections in the Muslim community. And U.S. attorneys in 17 districts, including mine, were asked to pilot outreach into those communities. So I went to my FBI SAC, the special agent in charge in Birmingham, a great guy, and said, Rick, I need to go talk to our Muslim community. Where's our Muslim community? And he said, uh, don't worry, I've got this covered. There are two mosques, one's in Birmingham, one's in Huntsville. We interact with them. We know everything. You don't really need to get involved. But I was a good soldier, and I'd been given my marching orders. Um, so my friend Google and I spent some time together. And I learned that there were actually five mosques in Alabama, those two large mosques, another large mosque in Tuscaloosa, two smaller mosques populated almost exclusively by doctors in the cities of Gadsden and Anniston. There were also active student groups at many of our major colleges and universities, 
And there was a large Sikh temple in Little Bessemer, Alabama, halfway between Birmingham and Tuscaloosa, so those communities could pray together. It was important to reach out to Sikhs because Sikh men who wear turbans are often mistaken for Muslims and had been the target of violence after 9-11. And so I brought my team together and said, we're going to go out and visit the Muslim community. And I was um, met with uh, maybe some folks who weren't really thrilled uh, about doing that and thought we had other work to do and didn't know why we were going to do this. But we set out a group of us to meet with the leadership of the mosque in Birmingham. And you need to know a little bit about me to understand just how unusual this was because I'm a Jewish girl from Los Angeles. Um, I married my law school sweetheart. I've lived in Birmingham for almost 30 years now. But at heart, you know, I'm still a Jewish girl from L.A., and so I was about to walk into a mosque, and I wondered what my reception would be like. And it was a warm reception. Um, we had to get to know each other at first, like you always have to. And there was enormous concern in the Muslim community at this point in time in 2009, 2010, about FBI surveillance of activities in mosques and this effort to criminalize and demonize um, the entire uh, Muslim religion in this country. So it was important for us walking in to say, you know, we're not here about terrorism. That's a, a topic. It's a topic for another day. It's not a topic for today. We're concerned about your civil rights. Our job is to let you know what your rights are, what we can do to protect them, and to make sure that you know how to get in touch with us. And they obviously had to get to know us a little bit better and have a comfort level to understand that that was really why we were there. But we built that relationship in the five mosques and with our student groups over time. And they had never before as a community felt like they could come to us for advice. It was little things at first. A problem with a bank that was putting holds on transfers that didn't need to have a hold on them. And so we interfaced with the bank. There was an issue with how Muslim prisoners in Alabama's prisons were being treated. And we were able to bring the head of the Department of Corrections to the table with some of the Muslim leaders so they could work that out. There was no place for Muslims to pray in the Birmingham airport. And the few of them who were obligated to um, perform one of their five-day ritual prayers while waiting in the airport had experienced some problems. And again, we were able to work with the community. And over time, that relationship developed into something enormously special. Early on as U.S. attorney, I learned that four years before, a Muslim man in Tuscaloosa had been shot by an attacker who called Muslim slurs as he fired the gun. And that was never reported to our office. And by the time we got wind of it, it was almost too late. We did some work around the edges, but for procedural reasons, we couldn't really do anything with that situation. The community began to feel like they could come to us and talk with us about civil rights violations. And that was important to me, even though there wasn't a statistic attached to it. And at the end of the day, there came a time when leadership of the mosque came to me and said, we have a concern about someone in our community who we think is engaging in criminal conduct. And we feel like we can trust you and share this with you. And in fact, they brought something to our attention that could have been incredibly risky to the safety of our community and perhaps um, other communities. Had they not done so, it resulted in a now public criminal prosecution of a young Uzbeki man who had overstayed his passport and hatched a plot to um, assassinate the president. And we were able, because the community trusted us and we could work together, to arrest him um, after he made the effort to acquire a machine gun and some hand grenades. So it was a serious threat, and it was a criminal case. But because we understood that the community was not a community of criminals, it was just people like us who wanted to raise their kids, we were able to work together on both civil rights and the protection of the community. In virtually every mosque at some point in our relationship, I had the same conversation with someone there. They said, you know, you're the first U.S. attorney who's ever come to us, and you're really not what we expected. And we um, appreciated that and had to share with them that, that we too, you know, had not expected the warmth of the relationship that would develop. But at the end of the day, our obligation was to protect the entire community, not just the parts of the community that were accessible to us. 
And that leads me to the last piece about immigration I'll share with you. In 2011, the Alabama legislature passed HB 56, which I lovingly refer to as the Alabama Deport Yourself Hispanic Immigrants Bill. Um, it was far angrier than the Arizona bill, which the Justice Department was already challenging. It had provisions that were designed to keep school children out of school. And the Supreme Court has held in a case called Plyler versus Doe that whether you're an American citizen or not, you've got a right to a K through 12 education. Well, Alabama had decided to essentially do away with that right for school children by requiring that they provide information on their parents' status as immigrants when they registered for school. Statute forced local police, many of whom were up in arms about it, to become immigration enforcers, and they didn't want to do that. And it also made it illegal for folks who were doing volunteer work through churches and other religious entities to transport people who did not have legal status to doctor's appointments and other meetings. And so the church groups weren't real happy about this law either. But the sad truth about HB 56 was that it was passed with overwhelming support in the supermajority Republican Alabama legislature and the community, business community, leaders, folks who I would have expected to be up in arms really weren't. As a U.S. attorney, my quibble with the law going back to our conversation this morning was that it violated the preemption clause. Yeah. It's very clear from the Constitution that policy on immigration is set in Washington. And that's an obvious sort of thing for us to understand. You can't ask a country to deal, a foreign country, to deal with a patchwork quilt of 50 states' different primary top-level immigration policies. So early on, I knew that we wanted to take the very unusual step, in fact, the first time my office had ever challenged um, an Alabama state law on constitutionality grounds. But we really needed some voices in the community that would go along with that, and they just weren't, weren't emerging. And so I convened a meeting of civil rights stakeholders in our community. As, as you might imagine, in Birmingham, that's a large and diverse group, ranging from um, Asian immigrants who've come in as the car companies have established factories in Alabama, the Muslim community, we have a, obviously a, a growing Hispanic community, folks in the African American community, disability advocates, folks in the LGBTQ community, folks from the religious community. And we had a large room full of people seated around a, ta seated around a table, and I began to talk about the bill and ask whether people had concerns, and no one was really speaking up. There is a wonderful judge, now a retired judge in Birmingham, the first African-American judge that we had in our federal district court named UW Clemen. And UW signified that he wanted to speak. And he was quiet for a moment. He gathered his thoughts in this wonderful way that he had. And then he looked around the room at everyone and he said, Brown is the new black. He said, we didn't fight in the 60s for ourselves just to walk away from this fight. And to this day, I'm tremendously grateful for his words, for his support. He actually came along in the case as a lawyer representing some of the religious institutions. And we did challenge HB 56 in court. We did it successfully, although not until we reached the 11th Circuit. And what that has to say about the role that U.S. attorneys can play, I think is very simply this. The civil division in my office and in most of the U.S. attorneys' offices in the Deep South did not have a track record of doing plaintiff's civil litigation. We did defensive work. We represented the United States when it got sued. And one of my colleagues from our appellate division actually worked on the case with me, which I handled personally, with our fabulous colleagues in the Civil Rights Division and in the Civil Division in Washington. And we mounted this first-time challenge. Our bench was stunned, and a lot of the judges said to me, what, are, are you running a plaintiff civil rights law firm in the United States Attorney's Office? And I said, yes, 
Yes, because that's what our mission has to be. And increasingly, whether that's work that we did on behalf of the LGBT community or work we did for Americans with disabilities or civil rights cases on behalf of veterans, that is our work. And it was embodied in the work that we did on behalf of Hispanic immigrants in Alabama during the HB 56 litigation. Um, I had the great good fortune to work for an attorney general who gave me the latitude to do that. That support, which was replicated across the country in all 93 districts, enabled an entire generation of U.S. attorneys to re-envision their work so that rather than judging ourselves based on the number of cases that we were doing, we were looking at the impact that they had on the people who we worked for. So Justice Jackson, I think I started by telling you, made the seminal speech, the touchstone speech, that when U.S. attorneys are talking with each other about what's our job, what's our obligation, how do we relate with our communities, it's what we all refer back to. And I think it's appropriate to close with his words. He told the assembled U.S. attorneys in 1940 that prosecutors have their authority because we as a country want crime eliminated. But we want that done while the best in American traditions are preserved. He said, while you're being diligent and strict and vigilant, you can still be just. You can still be just. And those are the words that we all carried forward with us in our tenure. When I resigned as U.S. Attorney, I took on the most important job I suspect I'll ever have, the job of being a private citizen. And I think all of our job now in a somewhat difficult era as private citizens is to make sure that we hold this next generation of U.S. attorneys and prosecutors and other government officials, that we hold them accountable to Justice Jackson's charge, that they be just. Thank you. to talk for? Okay. Thank you very much. It's really a great privilege to be here um, and uh, to talk with you all about a current fight that we're having in the immigration arena to bring civil rights values into the immigration arena, which is a fight that we're having on a bunch of fronts, and I'm going to talk about two of them. I, um, I too, want to I want to start with some words of Justice Jackson, which come from the Korematsu dissent that he wrote. I actually don't, it's not so much that I care, I'm, I'm going to decontextualize them a little bit. He was talking about um, judicial opinions that ratify military orders. And he, and he, he said this in dissent. He said, once a judicial, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply this in a, in a slightly broader way. Once a judicial opinion rationalizes an order to show that it conforms to the Constitution, or rather rationalizes the Constitution to show that the Constitution sanctions such an order, the court for all time has validated the principle of racial discrimination in criminal procedure and of transplanting American citizens let me just say that again, has validated the principle of racial discrimination in criminal procedure and the idea of racial discrimination in transplanting American citizens. The principle then lies around like a loaded weapon, ready for the hand of any authority that can bring forward a plausible claim of an urgent need. Every repetition embeds the principle more deeply in our law and thinking and expands it to new purposes. So what I want to do is think about that in the purposes and the principles that have underlay our immigration constitutional law and think about what kind of loaded guns have we created as a constitutional matter and what use are those loaded guns being put to now. So that's what I'm planning to do and I'm going to do that by talking about two cases um, uh, and some general things as well. The, the travel ban case and a much less famous case, one that's going on right now, and some of you may have seen me like being a little bit compulsive on my email the past couple days. That's because I'm litigating a case that 
we won, a, we won a, a TRO, a temporary restraining order, last night, and we're going back to the court today to ask him to expand it, and I'm here, and um, it's causing me a little bit of anxiety. So forgive me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assuage that anxiety by telling you all about it a little bit. So um, before I get to that, let me, let me say that I, I used to work at the Department of Homeland Security. I was in the early Obama administration, the... Um, what's called the Officer for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties in the Department of Homeland Security. And so I thought a lot in that context about what kinds of civil rights values the government ought its own self to apply to its own activities in a realm, immigration, national security, right, in a realm in which the government is quite undersupervised by the courts. And so I thought a lot about I'm working I'm working for the first, you know, the first constitutional law professor who's become the president, right? I'm working for the first black president. I'm thinking about what does civil rights look like on the inside? And so after a, a lot of discussion and thinking, and I, I, I do teach constitutional law, and I've been a civil rights lawyer for a pretty long time, Joyce and I discovered that we, we worked together on a, a matter a really long time ago, um, an affirmative civil rights matter in, the, in, in um, Alabama. Um, we distilled it down to three ideas, that the, the civil rights inside the government needed to be about three ideas, and those ideas are equality, liberty, and fairness. And so we thought a lot about those are the, those are the pole stars, those are, those are the, guiding, the guiding ideas. I, I actually said to my, my colleagues and my staff a lot that we were not the office of niceness, um, that we had to have something a little bit more than just being nice. We had to have a little more content, and that those were the contents, equality, liberty, fairness. So I'm going to come back to that in a minute, because when I left government and got back out, and then particularly in this administration, which seems to not really care very much about equality, liberty, and fairness um, for many, many, many parts of the American community, I keep thinking about how can we make those the touchstone values of the immigration system as well as of other things. All right, so with that as the introduction, let me say this. You heard a terrific guide this morning from, from Lucas Gutentag about how at the very birth of the constitutional regulation or non-regulation, the, the, the decision not to regulate the immigration system, um, that at the very birth of what's called the plenary power doctrine was racism, that that was present at the founding, right? And we have to remember that. So the Che Chan Ping case, the Chinese exclusion case that he talked about, you know, it, it reached a, a, a racially problematic result, but Lucas didn't read to you some of the language in that case, which was not just ratifying racism, not just saying, okay, you know, Congress may do, you know, it didn't do that. It actually entirely partook of that racism. The court in that decision in 1889 talked about Chinese immigrants as hordes, as hordes of people threatening to overrun the United States. It was a, an animalistic, kind of a set of um, tropes that is very familiar to anybody who has looked at American history and how, how we in our racist history talk about Asians in particular, right? So they are strangers among us. Um, here's another uh, similar in era phrase. This is from, um, wait, where did I put it? Shoot. Yeah, here it is. This is from another case that's at, at a similar time, United States versus Wong Kim Ark. This one actually came out a different way. It said, no, 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 when people are born here, even if their parents are Chinese, they, they still get to be American. But I want you to hear the dissent in that language because it's really important to kind of understanding. The dissent didn't have any success in that particular opinion, but the dissent was really important in the immigration context. Um, as characterizing the way that the courts thought about the Chinese in particular. Um, what Justice Fuller wrote, joined by Justice Harlan, who you remember is the, the, the guy who's in favor of the colorblind constitution, right? Justice Harlan, the civil rights hero, right? Okay. So this is Fuller joined by Harlan. And what he writes is that the Chinese who, who live here, that 
The Chinese are a distinct race and religion, remaining strangers in the land, residing apart by themselves, tenaciously adhering to the usages and customs of their own country, um, unfamiliar with our institutions, and apparently incapable of assimilating with our people. And so that idea about what happens with particular groups of immigrants, that they are incapable of becoming American, right? Even in Plessy itself, when Harlan writes much the same thing, although not quite as explicitly, when he talks about how it's okay for the Chinese to be a different race, to never become citizens, right? Even, it, and that's in, in the paradigm case, the, the, the case that is the beacon of the, of the idea that white supremacism shouldn't be reflected in the Constitution. That case contains in it this idea that immigration is different and that the Chinese are different, right? Those two ideas. And so at, as we've watched, well, let me, let, me, let me not get to the end of that. Let me say one other thing about what's at the foundation of the plenary power. At the foundation of the plenary power besides racism, which is key, is this idea about foreign policy. And I didn't bring any quotes to read to you about this, but I'll just tell you there's dozens of quotes about this, right? The plenary power is about foreign policy. So how can we govern? We can't govern the courts, say. We can't govern what the Congress does. We can't govern what the president does. They're regulating our interaction with foreign governments. It's just not, it's beyond the judicial ken, right? Those are the two core ideas. So I offer that to you. Those are the two core ideas, racism and foreign policy. Now, the racism idea becomes less and less and less attractive, right? We had a constitutional revolution since 1889. We've had, if not the end of white supremacism, not the end of white supremacism, we've had at least the end of the judicial explicit ratification of white supremacism in our constitutional doctrine, right? And that's happened over a period of time, and, and there's a lot of cases that contribute to that, and a movement that brought those cases, that t moved the courts towards that, um, towards that idea and ideal, and um, we have among us people who have been crucial in that movement, and I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to notice, nice work, right? The civil rights movement moved the doctrine in a way that really matters, right? And so, so the Chinese exclusion case becomes an embarrassment constitutionally. The, the, the frank racism that is at the core of the plenary power is no longer sufficient as a matter of constitutional order to support the plenary power. And the question is, what's going to substitute for it? And you might say, oh, I know, foreign policy. But the problem is that you've heard another talk today from Rick, who says immigration isn't about foreign policy anymore. It's not really what we talk about. And you heard from Lucas, who told us why. Because in 1965, the Congress passed a law that said we're not going to use the immigration law to do deals and pay special favors and negotiate with other governments. We're actually going to have an immigration system that has a, a norm of equality embedded in it. That's why Lucas said this morning that the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 is a civil rights statute because it serves one of those core three ideas that are the civil rights ideas which are equality, liberty, and fairness. So the INA commits us to an equality idea. Does it commit us wholesale? No. Not in every single way, but in a really important way. And that's a civil rights, light, it, it's a sea change. And so all of a sudden, we've got this equality idea in the immigration system. And the equality idea is not only consistent with what I just said about the Chinese exclusion case, right? This idea that, like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, the reason you're going to say that this is constitutional is because the Chinese stink? Right? Really? Like, are you kidding me? Right? But no longer can we say anymore either, oh, you know, it's all about, like, like individual negotiation and diplomacy with the individual countries, because we don't do that anymore for our immigration system. So what's going to support the plenary power doctrine? I offer to you that we've got basically nothing. There is basically nothing in support of the plenary power doctrine. Okay, pause for one moment. So simultaneously with that, we've got this 
beginning of the use of the immigration system and immigration authorities, which you heard about from, um, from Joyce, to serve a public safety purpose, right? Really important move that people who write about it often call crimigration, right? This idea that immigration authorities are not being enforced as immigration authorities, they are ways to get at dangerous people. And I, I get it. I get it. I've participated in the same administration as Joyce did. I, I you know, been there. I, I get it. And it's not, it's not, there's nothing nonsensical about that at all. But I just want you to notice that all of the things that support the constitutional doctrine about immigration, the deference that colors that constitutional doctrine, which are about racism and foreign policy, they don't actually support the idea that we can use immigration authority to do criminal justice work. If we're going to use immigration authorities to do criminal justice work, we need kind of a different theory of it all. And so the new use of immigration authorities to do public safety criminal justice work is um, problematic in, in a, a world of constitutional doctrine. And let me just say one more thing about that, and then I'm 13 minutes in, then I'm going to move to the Muslim cases, the, uh, and, and this Chaldean case too. What I mean by it being problematic is this. In general, we have an idea in our criminal justice work that you don't do group thinking in the world of criminal justice. It's one of the core commitments about equality and fairness. Right? You don't go after particular kinds of people because other people like them are problematic. Right? You don't say the Dominicans run really tough, the Dominican Americans run really tough like, like violent drug things, so I'm going to target Dominican Americans for drug enforcement. You don't do that. You don't say, um, uh, Ni Nigerian Americans are fraudsters, so I'm going to target Nigerian Americans for fraud. You don't say that. You don't say that about groups. You don't say it about nationality groups, ethnic groups, racial groups, religious groups. You don't do that in criminal justice. And I don't mean to say that the Obama administration did that in the immigration world. I actually don't think they did. I think that what the Obama administration did was use immigration authorities to go after people they would have gone after anyway. Um, in, in many situations. So I, I'm not actually, I'm not, I, I see Joyce writing and I, I, I want to just be clear, I'm not attacking you. Okay, all right, all right, I want to just be clear, we're all among friends here, so. <laughs> but, but that said, crimigration is inconsistent. Crimigration is inconsistent with the basic structure of the plenary power doctrine. And I want to just point that out. Okay, so now we get to these two recent challenges. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about each one, and then I'm going to draw all those threads together, and then I'm going to sit down. Um, so throughout his campaign, President Trump talked over and over and over about a Muslim ban. He talked about how dangerous Islam was, and he talked about how there were a lot of bad people. And when, and when asked, do you mean all Muslims are bad? He said, well, maybe not all, but most. Right? So he talked about a Muslim ban, and he talked about banning everybody who was Muslim from um, visiting or immigrating to this country. Um, and when he got attacked and told, but that's unconstitutional. Now pause for one second. Is that unconstitutional? It's actually no more racist than the Chinese exclusion case. Um, I think he's right. Well, he's not right, but I think it's true. It is unconstitutional. But that itself involves a... a, a a, a defeat of the norm of the Chinese exclusion case. But when told it was unconstitutional, he said, okay, and he goes to Rudy Giuliani and he says to Giuliani, he says, show me how to do this the legal way. Now, maybe he was saying, show me how to put some window dressing on it so the courts will uphold it. I think that's probably what he was saying. Maybe he's saying, oh, you guys got me. I'm totally persuaded. My ideas were all wrong. Now I just want to accomplish my very worthwhile end, but do it in, right? Have you ever heard, all right, I'm just going to not even, right? I'm not, I, I just, I can't even. So maybe he did that. But I think what he probably did, what he probably did is he said to Giuliani, I've got this thing I want to do, and everybody's like fussing at me, and you be my, be, be my fixer. 
Show me how to do it a legal way. I want to still do the same thing. Show me how to do it a legal way. And so um, out of that comes the, the first executive order, the first travel ban. And that, what it does is it picks out seven countries, uh, Iran, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, Somalia, Sudan, Libya, all majority Muslim countries, not all the majority Muslim countries, there are countries not on that list, but all majority Muslim countries. Um, and it, it takes the nationals of those countries and it subjects them to uniquely disadvantageous treatment as both immigrants and visitors. And it does not exempt anybody, the first one, right? And you all watched it unfold at the airports, right? There's chaos at the airports and the ACLU makes a ton of money because everybody wants to do something and what they do is, all right, just kidding. So, um, so there's chaos at the airports and why is there chaos at the airports? Because there's no rollout and there's no exemptions and it covers everybody, no matter how tight their connection to the United States is, it covers legal permanent residents, it covers people who were in school and went home on holiday and now they're back. It covers them without any warning. There were people who got on a plane, came to the United States, they were in status, they were valid to enter, they arrived at the gates at JFK and they were told that they were committing a crime. Their, their visas torn up and they were sent, well I don't actually know if they were sent home from JFK, but there were airports from which they were sent home. So. Chaos ensues and instantly the courts set in and enjoin it, right? And there's a couple of um, very dramatic days of litigation which end, the, the executive order was passed on January 20, uh, was signed on January 27th, 2017, and on February 7th, the Ninth Circuit enters a full opinion saying, nope, we're going to consider it more slowly, but in this preliminary posture, no way it's enjoined, right? So at that, the president tweets, see you in court, which, pause for one second, is not a very big threat against judges who, you know, they, right, who live in court, right? Okay, that sounds perfect. When's your brief coming? So, so he says, see you in court. But in fact, what the Justice Department does is they say, and we change our mind. We're not going to defend that executive order. We're going to write a new one. The president's going to write a new one, and we'll defend the new one. And so they come back with a second executive order. It takes a full month before the president signs the second executive order. In the meantime, this first one, which he had said was super duper urgent to protect the United States from, you know, the, the marauders who are trying to get to us, like for a month, it stayed. And you know, he could have had a second order in three days, right? It's not that long, but he doesn't. It takes a month, and a month later, he comes back with another executive order. And this executive order is much more careful. It doesn't touch all of the legal permanent residents. It has a phase-in period. It has a waiver process, and it leaves off a rack. I'm, I'm going to get to the leaving off a rack part because that's setting the stage for my, the second case I want to tell you about. But it leaves off a rack, and, and it gets unrolled, and... The White House says, okay, we're good now, right? And the courts say, no, I'm sorry, you're not good now. It's still a Muslim ban. The point of it, the purpose behind it, taints it. And the purpose of it is that it's a Muslim ban. And you can say all you want that Congress has given you in the Immigration and Nationality Act full authority to regulate and order the entry of aliens. You can say that all you want, but A, it's wrong under the INA. There's actually other provisions of the INA that undermine that claim. And B, it's wrong under the Constitution because it can't violate the Equal Protection Clause and the Free Exercise Clause or the Establishment Clause. And so you, the norm of equality, say the litigants, is, has come into the immigration system and governs it. Now, here's the point. The Trump administration does not defend by saying, no, you've got the foundational commitments of the immigration system wrong. They don't defend plenary power. They don't defend the idea that equality isn't part of the immigration system. They don't defend on the basis of the Chinese exclusion case. They defend by saying, Two things. One, no, that's not what it's about. It's actually a national security law that has really to do with the countries, not the religion. It's, it's just, you've got this wrong. It's not an anti-Muslim law uh, uh, order. And two, to the extent there's any evidence that it is an anti-Muslim order, 
the courts need to have a particular set of blinders on that forbid that evidence from being considered by the department, by, uh, by, the, by the judges. So they're not allowed to consider anything that happened before Inauguration Day, and they're not allowed to consider anything that um, isn't sort of a, a rising to a level of, a, a certain level of kind of officialness. Um, and so all that evidence of bias, of animus, is outside the range of what the courts can consider. Okay, so those are the two claims. And the, so far, the Trump administration has lost on those claims. So in the Fourth Circuit, the Court of Appeals um, uh, that sits um, pertinently to this case in Maryland, um, the Fourth Circuit said, we don't think we have to have blinders on, and we think the administration's purpose was full, was, was dominated by animus. So it's no good for that reason. The Ninth Circuit says, we think that your assertion of, 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 of delegated authority from the Congress misunderstands the scheme that is the Immigration and Nationality Act, which embeds in it a commitment to equality that you are disregarding. And those are the two opinions that have happened so far at appellate levels, and they are now both pending before the Supreme Court. Okay, so that's the Muslim ban case. So what do we notice about that? We notice that neither of those, nobody is saying that equality is not part of the immigration system. Everybody agrees with that. That's a really interesting move, right? Really interesting move. And so I don't know what the court will do. I, I'm no good, uh, like, I mean, it's, it's uh, like predicting, it's all about, you know, Justice Kennedy, and I'm no better at predicting Justice Kennedy than anybody else is. So, um, so I don't know what the court will do, but I am hopeful that, and I should just, by, by way of full disclosure, I'm, you know, one of a group of counsel in one of these cases, not in one of the two that I just talked about, but in a, a version of this that's being brought in Michigan. Um, so it's obvious what I think should happen, but I should just say that, that at least I find a hopeful message in the development of the immigration system that nobody is saying that equality is outside the norms that are at that are crucial to be applied in the immigration system that's actually the agreement in this case and that is a notable development all right the second case and I'll be very fast on this one came out of that Iraq part so how is it that the Trump administration left Iraq off the list and turned a seven-country ban into a six-country ban? The answer is they entered into a negotiation with Iraq where Iraq agreed to accept deportations from the United States of Iraqis, even including Iraqis who have been here many years, including Iraqis who have committed um, both minor and non-minor crimes. So um, on... They, and, and the administration did a little bit of uh, using that new availability of deportation to Iraq uh, in April and early May, but only a little bit. They deported eight people. But, and then in June, on June 11th, uh, around the country, ICE went out and arrested what seems to be, have been about 200 um, Iraqis, including many who had been here for decades, um, who's deportation, who, who had final orders of removal from a long, long time ago, but who had not been able to be deported because uh, Iraq wouldn't accept them in prior years. 114 of them are from my community of Metro Detroit. And the, um, a, a lawsuit ensued, and last night the um, district court granted a 14-day pause while he figures out some very complex jurisdictional questions, which I am not going to talk about here. Um, but what I want to just tell you about for two more minutes, and then I will subside, is that the claim of this lawsuit is about the other one, remember, equality, liberty, and fairness. Um, uh, I'm going to leave liberty out, not because I want to, but because I only have time to do two cases. But it's about the fairness argument about civil rights. The claim of this case is that when the um, Department of Homeland Security took people who had been here for decades, who were complying with orders of supervision, who were living out their lives in kind of normal ways, who have American spouses and American children and long-standing equities in this community, even though they also have these previously granted decades-old 
orders of, of, of removal, when it took them and without notice to them, arrested them and said, and we're deporting you in three days, that it did something unfair. That under United States law, those detainees have a right to be heard on current country conditions that might render their removal um, unsafe in a variety of ways, that it might um, lead to their persecution or their torture. The majority of the 114, like about 100 at least, of the 114 Detroit Iraqi, Iraqis who are being detained are Chaldean, they are Christian. And what's been going on in northern Iraq, where the Chaldean community lives in Iraq, has been termed by the U.S. Congress itself to be genocide. I mean, so, so the stakes could not be higher for them. They are absolutely in deep trouble if they get deported. And they have a right under U.S. law to say, hey, maybe in 1988 we weren't going to be in deep trouble if we got deported. And so we didn't put on a claim that said that we would. But since 2014, when ISIS took over Mosul and swaths of northern Iraq, that's different. And we now need to be heard. And your hurry towards deportation is violating our due process rights. And so we will see what happens. But again, the effort in this case is to bring a civil rights idea, the idea of fairness, into an immigration system, which at its birth, the constitutional law said, no, 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 we don't do that. But we've been watching the erosion of that exclusion of constitutional values from immigration for, for generations now. And push is coming to shove. And so I am really hopeful that um, we'll land somewhere good with all of that. And that the, those ideas, equality, liberty, and fairness, which are um, will we'll enter the immigration system. And the idea that's lying around like a loaded gun, plenary power, which at the start was about racism and foreign affairs, is no longer, hopefully, is no longer being allowed to serve those particular functions. It's being grafted to serve other functions. And maybe it's time to unload the gun. And so with that, I will. Um, uh, Thank you once again for letting me uh, present today. Thank you. We're going to do another one of our very popular stand and stretch in place, uh, two minute interlude, and then we'll have a Q&A session. In part of the program where we've been working together all day, so it is very collegial. Um, it's on the brink of informal, but for starters, um, Joyce and Margot uh, will welcome your questions. Look, we've stumped them. They have no questions. That's it. Yes, Bob. I want to thank you, Margot, for adding liberty, equality, and fairness. I, I, worked a while in, in Europe on foreign affairs things, and a lot of my European friends remind me that the French use solidarity instead of fairness. And I found that when you use solidarity as the third pillar of that standard, you start, it's almost like racism. It starts discriminating people and turning against people and it can lead to violence and authoritarianism. So thank you for making it better. <laughs> Thanks. You're two for two on non-questions. <laughs> um, but you're, you're welcome to comment on that. Fraternité versus fairness, are those different things? Uh, yes. Yes, I think they are. I mean, I think the point is exactly as you just acknowledged, right, that we owe fairness to people I mean, maybe there's at some idea, there's this, at some depth, there's this idea that the reason you owe people fairness is because you have something in common with them. But I actually just prefer to say you owe them fairness because you owe them fairness, right? You don't have to establish the commonality before you get to the due process. So, um, so yeah, I think it's a different, a different idea. It's, you would have enjoyed the meetings we had to try to think about, you know, I mean, it was silly, right? But we were writing a mission statement. 
<laughs> I've never written a mission statement before or since. But it was actually, um, it was actually a fun exercise to think. I mean, I've been a civil rights lawyer since I graduated from law school, and I had not thought about well, what does that mean? What what are the what are the core commitments? And so it was fun to do that with the staff, um, and get everybody's ideas and try to encapsulate it. Yes. Jack. Um, I'm, I'm curious, how much flexibility does, does the new administration have to change what you were talking about uh, without fresh legislation having to go through Congress? How much interpretive discretion do they have? Well, um, which part are we talking about? Well, you mean like, we like, talk about both agencies yeah, 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 separately, yeah, maybe? Sure. Um, in DOJ, much of this guidance that I was discussing comes at the pleasure of the Attorney General. So we saw Attorney General Sessions really in the first month of his tenure uh, issue a new policy uh, discussing the standard for criminal prosecutions. And this may be a little bit too inside baseball, but essentially he returned us to an older war on crime era where the standard is in every case, you should indict the uh, charge that will give you the lengthiest sentence. Prosecutors had had a great deal of discretion uh, under what was called the Holder Doctrine to uh, file a charge that was appropriate to the circumstances of the crime and in the best interests of the community. But now we'll go back to essentially days of lock them up and throw away the key. That's not a statutory change, it's a policy change. We've seen in the last week the nomination of the first seven new U.S. attorneys, and they'll come in with marching orders from their boss. And, and I understand that in my district, which is one of the first districts to have a nominee, that they expect some fairly radical changes. They've already been directed to create a new immigration section, and they will pursue immigration cases um, to the fullest extent of the law. So we'll see a lot of change without any change coming from the Congress. The, um, the Obama administration, Department of Homeland Security, uh, following in the footsteps of some prior administrations, this wasn't entirely novel, but with a little bit more full uh, application, came up with this idea of, uh, and tried to implement an idea of prioritization in immigration enforcement um, that uh, meant that certain people who were in certain categories of situations could rest a little easier and have more productive lives as a result because they knew that they were not a priority. Um, the, um, the Kelly uh, DHS, the Trump administration, has explicitly rescinded that idea of prioritization and has said everybody's a priority who's out of status. The thing is that if, every, if, if we have 11 million folks here who are out of status, and that's the number people tend to use, I'm looking at my colleagues to see if anybody thinks I'm wrong, but I think 11 million is still pretty safe, right? If we have 11 million, we can't deport 11 million people. I mean, there's just, there's no apparatus to deport 11 million people. I mean, not to mention the injustice of it, but even if you don't agree that it's unjust, we just can't possibly deport 11 million people. And so that means everybody can't be a priority. There's gonna be some prioritization. And the question is, where is that prioritization gonna come from? Is it gonna come from a departmental level and some thinking out of who it should be? Or is it gonna come from a line level and either it's, you know, whoever comes across ICE's door, or, or what? There used to be a, a, a category of people who got put into deportation proceedings because they erroneously applied for an adjustment of status when they had children, because they thought that if they had U.S. citizen children, that entitled them to some kind of immigration benefit. That actually turns out not to be the case. But they thought it was, and so they wrote a letter. You know, dear USCIS, that's the agency that does this, could you please adjust my status? And USCIS would say, this is before the Obama administration, not only no, but by the way, we're gonna send your letter over to ICE or over to the immigration courts and we're gonna put you into proceedings because you had the temerity to ask. 
Okay, so I just want to pause for that. Think about that, right? When there's no, why would those be the people who you'd want to prioritize? Like, on what possible world would that be the people you'd want to prioritize? Or workplace raids, right? Why would you want to go to people who are working hard to support their families and say, you guys, you are the ones who we're going to, why would you do that? So when you say we're not going to prioritize, what you mean is somebody else is going to decide what the priorities are. And that could be a U.S. attorney in some ways, right, because, because you, put, you, you, you lock people up for felonies and then they're all going to get deported mm -hmm. at the end of that. It could be an ICE officer. It could be any number of people. But it doesn't mean you don't prioritize. And so, so that can be done without any legislation. The other thing is that if you focus on the easy cases, you can make your numbers grow. And so the easy cases are not the ones with people who also have criminal involvement or have these complex kinds of situations. The easy cases are different than that. And you want to make your numbers, that's where you go. You, you go to that, and that's actually, um, you go to people who have been living with orders of supervision and who report in every year or every six months. Because nothing is easier than taking somebody who's come in to report as they've been requested and saying, oh, it's really nice to meet you, Mr. Lopez. You're under arrest. And that's what's going on right now. The easy case is the dad of three American-born kids who's built a small business doing, you know, take your pick of what he's doing. Um, and the hard case is the cartel-linked drug trafficker. Yes, correct. Correct. And so if you want to make your numbers, you, you, you deport the dad. You don't deport yeah. the cartel guy. Yes, sir. It's been said by this uh, football president that uh, <laughs> he's really the president. <laughs> he really is. Kicked more, uh, deported more people than anybody else before in history, including uh, uh, Captain Kangaroo. And uh, uh, what they're doing now is nowhere near as bad, but uh, better. Has who? President Trump? No, President Obama. President Obama, in his eight years, deported more people than any president before him. He came into office with an apparatus that had been built up, um, so he started off with a, with a very large deportation machine, and although he eventually slowed that deportation machine down, he did not slow it down fast enough to avoid that title of the most deportations of any president. Also, he was in there for eight years. But it's also true that his deportations were, by and large, people, well, at least from the angle I saw, I suspect you saw another side, but for I instance, did. if you're convicted of a federal crime and you go to prison and you're not an American citizen, at the end of your sentence, you're deported. Under previous administrations, that process had not worked smoothly and often people were released. Under the Obama administration, if you went to prison for a violent crime, and really pretty much for any crime, you were deported at the end of service of your sentence. The Obama administration deported a lot of people of a lot of different types. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, that's absolutely true. It's, they didn't do what's going on right now. Arrests are up 40 percent. I mean, so let's just be clear. Um, President Trump is um, sprinting towards that record sprinting towards that record. And I have no doubt that he will make it. Um, but uh, I'll, maybe not. I mean, if he's only around for four years, he probably won't beat the eight-year record of the well, Obama the, administration. The problem but. is he'll make it, but we won't be safer because of it, because of this failure to prioritize um, the resources and, and really to line the resources up against the greatest risk to communities. Yeah. Other questions? I pulled one chair up. Lucas, please <laughs> make yourself comfortable. And Rick, if you would just tell oh, <laughs> Allie. I was going to say, Rick, you have to stand. <laughs> no, 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 I was asking Rick to carry his own chair, but Allie beat him to it. Um, so for this last segment, I mean, uh, you've been uh, an attentive, interested, and very smart audience and colleagues in this conversation. Um, and we would welcome uh, anything you wish to contribute, other questions or comments. But I, I guess I would first ask Lucas and Rick if there's uh, commentary or any byplay based on what you heard from Margo and from Joyce. Yeah, so just sort of the follow up with regards to the high number of deportations under Obama um, and the apparatus is set up. 
what I think is interesting and we'll assess with regard to the Trump administration, the apparatus was set up going into Obama, as Joy said, because they had already the local law enforcement cooperation and network, right, for secure communities and stuff, linking into federal enforcement. That's why the numbers went up so quickly, and they were dramatically able to expand their uh, enforcement capabilities. But something also happened when the deportations started going up, is that's when local communities started having, in some ways, because they're so heavily involved, started suggesting that, wait a minute, now that we're a part of the apparatus, we want to have a little bit of say in what kind of priorities you have uh, in terms of the interest of our community. Um, and there was a little bit of a scuffle for a while, but I think the way that it ended up towards the end uh, was that I think uh, whether strategically or because they agreed with what they were saying, uh, that Obama really started taking the interest of the communities themselves in designing their priorities. So they got in some sort of working relationship that I think, for the most part, whether you're in support of uh, immigrant rights or support of more removals, worked for both ends. One thing that I think will be really interesting going to the Trump administration is on the one hand, they're up-ramping federal enforcement efforts. On the other hand, they're seeing a huge defection in local uh, participation. And as he's gotten more belligerent, he's probably going to see a lot more of those. And there we're going to see exactly how it pans out. Is the extra amount of federal money and federal enforcement really going to make up for the fact that he has not been the art of the deal? He has not been bargaining or negotiating with local partners, and he's starting to lose them. And there's some early suggestion in the data that actually with regard to uh, 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 the, the sanctuary sort of movement, uh, that that is actually starting to put a damper in terms of that pipeline of removals. Well, I just want to say real quickly, it's important to understand the burden that enforcing immigration law imposes on local police officers. Because they're out working a traffic accident, they ask for ID, they realize one of the people involved in the accident is, not, is, is out of status, and they then have to call ICE. And they have to sit on the side of the road for two, three, four, five hours waiting for ICE to show up or go back. They have to fill out a lot of extra paperwork. They have to do a lot of work. So local police departments are by and large not Sheriff Arpaio in Arizona. They're not chomping at the bit to engage in immigration enforcement. And so in Alabama, when they were asked to do that by state law, there was a lot of pushback from law enforcement, not because they had ideological opposition, but saying, we don't have the resources to do your work for you, ICE. And so that, I think, is an interesting element of this, this discussion. Well, the thing, I was going to add a, just a few things. I think one is I think that we cannot absolve the Obama administration for its deportation policies. I think we have to recognize and be honest about what it was. Um, I think it was for the reasons that have been stated, the machinery had been erected. But I think in fairness it was also a policy choice and a political judgment by the White House as to how it wanted to position itself with regard to immigration and what I think it believed was a path to achieving so-called comprehensive immigration reform, legislative reform, that it needed to prove its bona fides on enforcement in order to achieve legislation that ultimately would improve the immigration system, give legal status to undocumented, um, and have a positive effect overall. You know, there was a lot of disagreements about whether that was a wise political judgment or not. But I think that was part uh, of what informed the Obama administration. I think after the um, legislation failed in 2013, there was a significant change in the Obama administration's approach. It had always engaged in the prioritization, as Margot um, and Joyce were pointing out, uh, and it did that then even more uh, after the failure of legislation in 2013, and then it tried to expand, as I mentioned very briefly, tried to create this new program for deferred action with even stricter prioritization, give some mechanism for uh, roughly four million people to have a temporary uh, work authorization and legal status pending some kind of legislative action. So I think there was a real evolution uh, over the period of the Obama administration. Um, this, the second thing I think, I just want to underscore again what was said about prioritization. What we have now, I think, is exactly what Joyce in particular was alluding to. If you don't tell line officers what the priorities are, 
the easiest way to get higher numbers is to go after the easiest, not the most important cases, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing ICE officers arrest students who have DACA status. We're seeing them go after people who are reporting for orders of supervision. It's a way to have high numbers, but it does nothing uh, to achieve effective or meaningful law enforcement to serve anything other than kind of what I view as an abdication of leadership by just telling ICE officers or local ICE offices, you know, just do whatever you want. And the testimony of the head of ICE the other day was every person, every person should be afraid. Every person without status uh, should be afraid. That's what he said. I don't know whether he was saying that because he wanted that to be the policy or whether he was just describing the policy, but it was definitely a an accurate description of what the policy is. And that's the third thing I would just add. I think that's also actually a conscious part of the Trump administration uh, um, approach, which is to instill fear in immigrant communities, to make people so afraid that they'll abandon their jobs, their homes, even their kids, in, and be afraid to go out, to be in public, and the goal of the administration, I think, is, is to scare them into leaving. Because it's not possible to deport the entire undocumented population, but it is not possible to scare them all away, but to scare a significant portion of them into going so deeply underground that they appear to have left. And I think that's part of the overall strategy of the administration. I, I just want to add one thing, which is that um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to having some conversation with Rick about this another time, but I don't actually think that what was driving the numbers at the Obama administration's peak, 400,000 people were being deported a year. That's the number. And I think that what actually built that capacity was much less local cooperation and much more the, the building up of the carceral side of the immigration system. When Congress insisted that 34,000 people be detained at any given time, what that means is that you have this waiting pool of people who can be easily deported. And so you keep them in detention and you run them through the immigration system fast. You keep them from finding lawyers because they're in detention where they can't locate the lawyers. You, you, you run the docket at a really speedy clip and you get them out. And so the average length of stay in detention is like 32 days, and that includes a lot of people who are there a long time. So there's a lot of people who are there under two weeks. So you put them in detention, you hold them for two weeks, and then they can't find a lawyer, they can't fight their case, and they, and they um, uh, voluntarily leave, or they try something I watched. I spent a day in immigration court the other day um, watching people try to assert defenses when they didn't have lawyers. And let me just say, like, like your heart goes out to them. Um, and so I actually think that the biggest factor, the biggest factor in the capacity of the immigration system to deport people is how big is the detained population and how many judges are there devoted to processing those cases. And um, that came in to the Obama administration done. Um, and when Trump says that he's, when, when you read these things about how the Trump administration is going out and they want to run a detention system that has, I don't remember what the last number I read, I, don't, I think it was 54, some number like that, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah, 55, 54, yeah. 55. 54, 55,000 people? Like, we get 54, 55,000 people in detention, we're talking about 700,000 people a year getting deported. Like, that's, that's where the work happens. And it's interesting that they have surged immigration um, judges out of places in the interior of the country, out of places like New York, and they're putting them down on the border. I actually um, spoke with some of my old colleagues last week and heard that, that some of the immigration judges and people that support that system have been forcibly moved. First they asked for volunteers, but now it's an edict. You will go down to the border, which is an interesting judgment because, for instance, in New York where there are very high case backlogs, um, that means immigration may not move at as quick of a pace as, as it will work in the Southwest. That's right. So can I ask you guys about terrorism? Um, because <laughs> We're again it. You're again it. We're all again it. Um, what would, putting aside racism and xenophobia, you know, uh, the sort of authentic, legitimate national security concerns that, of course, we all share, we're all again it, um, are those related to our immigration system and the enforcement of those laws? And what would smart, proper immigration law enforcement be doing right now if 
we really were concerned solely about national protection against terrorism. Look, the fight against terrorism is not a fight against immigrants. It is primarily a fight against people who are in this country legally, many of them born and raised here, who become radicalized over the internet. And every time an American politician stands up and says words to the effect of we are at war with Islam, folks over in the Middle East and other places where terrorist groups live take those words and those video clips and they use them to recruit more people to the fight for terrorism. So Trump's Muslim ban, God alone knows how many new incidents of terrorism or attempts at terrorism will be spawned as a result of the Muslim ban. It's counterproductive. Immigration and national security need to be decoupled. And I'll say to you what I always say when, when people raise this issue. In Birmingham, Alabama, the single greatest act of terrorism um, in my community, and I, I say in my lifetime because really it's the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing in which four little girls were killed by Ku Klux Klan members, but in my life in Birmingham, the single greatest um, terrorist attack was conducted by a right-wing Christian activist named Eric Robert Rudolph, who blew up an abortion clinic and killed a police officer, and who had also been responsible for the Olympic Park bombing in Atlanta. Not a foreigner, not a Muslim, but a homegrown American kid who looks like, you know, most of us. I, I do think we need to make a distinction oftentimes when we talk about national security between, you know, the potential sort of attackers are really coming from abroad. And I think, as Joy said, the attackers uh, that are radicalized uh, within the United States. Um, and I think at some point we have to decide that with regard to certain individuals, that responsibility and impact is actually now on us that we can't just sort of cast an entire religion or nationality group uh, and just sort of make a hypothetical argument. Had their parents not arrived, then it wouldn't be an issue. Um, on the other hand, I think, and again, you know, not to sort of belabor the point, but so there was a sort of a, there was a famous sociologist who was working on uh, cities at the turn of the century, but if you're working on cities at the turn of the century in Chicago, you were essentially working on immigration. Um, Ezra Parks. So he had this very interesting sort of theory about the marginal man. Uh, which I think is sort of relevant today, because he said that what's primarily of concern to him uh, is the individual that's between generations. Uh, not quite maybe so connected to their homeland and sort of secure in that identity, but not quite entirely assimilated and sort of accepted by mainstream American culture. Uh, feeling rejected in some ways by both, but feeling not belonging in either. Um, and what was interesting is that he looked at it from a sociological perspective. So his sense of the marginal man wasn't that this was an inherent trait, but that this was in some ways the type of community, the type of association, the type of society in which he lived. And of course he talked about through the perspective of Chicago. And I can't help but feel about a lot of radicalization going on on either side, whether or not it's you know, white, uh, far right radical uh, extremists, uh, or maybe uh, extremists uh, 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 on the other end. Um, that in some ways they are kind of like marginal men, right? Uh, that are sort of stuck between two and really sort of dislocated. And at a certain point, I think we have to ask ourselves that that responsibility is in a way our own. Um, and what Joyce talked about, sort of reaching out to the community and making those communities feel like they're a part of the community and therefore uh, is able to sort of report these issues and sort of discuss them, I think is going to be critical. I mean. Those are your eyes on the ground, right? It's see something, say something. Uh, but until you have that trust, which again is an issue with the sanctuary city policy, until you have the trust, uh, you're really not going to get the most effective enforcement on that level. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm on the faculty at Fredonia, nearby university, and we have, I'm quite confident, a number of Dreamer Children's, DACA Children's, and uh, undocumented. Um, are we better off not knowing who they are? Or, I mean, because one of the things I know, we would be delighted to recruit more of them. Uh, that we do a lot of work on our campus with first generation students, that sort of thing. And I'm just curious, A, can we do anything beyond just providing a, you know, a uh, welcoming environment, uh, or what? Are we just sort of, well, hoping for the best? I think it's really important for universities 
to share, to develop and then share with their student body policies that are, um, that are really explicit about non-discrimination right, that they, they need to explicitly have a policy of non-discrimination. Policies about um, uh, what their mission is, which is to say educating people, not enforcing the civil rights laws, right? It's not in your, it's not in your mission to enforce the civil rights laws. And, and an idea about security that says that um, they are, only interested in cooperating where, where cooperation is voluntary, and there are situations where it's not, but where cooperation is voluntary with um, law enforcement or immigration enforcement, that they're only interested in doing that when it serves the safety of their students. Where, and where it's not voluntary, where it's court ordered, they'll do it, of course, but where it's voluntary that they have to be persuaded that it's in their community's interest. You don't just say yes to anything that a government agency asks you for. And if you can have those three commitments, then I think you, you have some hope of offering people a sense that they can be secure in their lives in your community. But I think those are the three crucial pieces of it. But what you don't want to do is anything that would create a paper trail or any other information that would document that oh, they yes, don't I, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I totally agree with that. I'm, I, right, right, I totally agree with that. not actually quantify or... Sh should we even say don't ask, don't tell? It has such <laughs> I know, a bad it has connotation. A I mean, you know, here's the thing. You do, in fact, know, because when, when a DACA student comes and works, um, their work authorization yes. form is specific to DACA. So there's no way that you cannot know unless your students right. aren't working. Right. So, so there are ways that you know, but, but there's no reason to do anything more than that. Like you're not going to be able to not know altogether unless the people aren't working and there aren't that many kids in that category who aren't working some jobs someplace. So you're going to know, but you're not going to have to know in a central office and you're not going to have a list and you're not, you're just going to, you're going to know because you comply with IRCA as of course you do, right? <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, uh, DACA, people with DACA status are not eligible for financial aid. So, and they are eligible for very few scholarships. So the DACA students that I know work really hard in the summers and usually go to community college because there's very, there's almost no way they could afford, you know, SUNY Fredonia, but JCC they can. So, and <laughs> though that varies state by state. So, and it, yeah. But it, I, I, I can speak to New York. Yeah. They, so they're, New York does not. They're ineligible yeah. for federal financial aid, but if a state right. were to provide financial aid, it would be different. Right. And I say this for New York, which is interesting because the Dream Act, the New York Dream Act, right. uh, has been introduced and sort of bandied around Loaded Albany down. for a number of years now. Yeah. Uh, and that would open up, as California has done, and surprisingly, you might know Kansas has done, or did. Right, given Chris Kobach and everything, um, uh, would open it up to state financial aid, right? Uh, but but not federal. They're okay. eligible for in-state tuition, but um, but that, yeah. that's some, some, yeah. In some states, that's. I mean, let me just add. There's there's a lot of discussion going on among universities and colleges about exactly how to kind of provide the kind of environment that you're talking about. It does vary a lot from state to state. It, depends also on whether it's a private university or a public university. So there's lots of different um, kind of uh, distinctions and there's also a number of different approaches but the Association of Universities and also the Association of Independent Colleges, they're all very actively engaged uh, in this and trying to provide different kinds of models and kind of menus almost of policies to adopt to provide the maximum kind of protection uh, and safety to the students. So there is a broader sanctuary campus movement the protection for records, a lot of them are looking into FERPA as a way of resisting potential uh, requests for information. Um, but just to add addendum, well, when I talked about the Texas anti-sanctuary movement, uh, they act, the law that Texas passed, they put uh, campus uh, universities into it. Yeah. I, so. I, I have to say that 
I'm, a, I'm on a committee that addresses some of these issues at the University of Michigan, and, and so I have a little bit more exposure to some of it than maybe I would otherwise. And I'll just offer this unsolicited piece of advice, which is that the word welcoming might serve you better than the word sanctuary. Yes, yes, yes. There's a nice diversity here among public. I, are you also yeah. with JCC? You're a school person? Okay, so public universities, private universities. Yeah. Um, mine is religiously affiliated, so just one more yeah, layer on this is that religiously affiliated universities, sometimes from that commitment, uh, are informed and, and try and craft their welcoming policies. Um, and maybe that's a layer of protection from external criticism. Yeah. Everything else, yeah. Yeah. Vincentian. Right, which is a service to the poor order historically. Uh, other questions? Um, yes, Sue. Can you talk a little bit about the pressure on institutions and um, employers when they're faced with a student, for example, in a medical school who then will be entering the match system and an employer, say, a, a uh, a hospital is now faced with making a commitment to that uh, potential resident through the match system and uh, most residencies are three, four years, whatever they are, and, and they may um, not be able to stay for that long because of the, the immigration problems. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of um, concerns or pressures there are on those institutions and hiring organizations that are affected by the rulings. So are you talking about DACA or are you, ooh, are you talking about other visas? No, I, I think it's primarily DACA, but I've, I've heard the concerns expressed. DACA uh, doctors? Well, that's the work authorization, but the, the fear that they would expire. Uh, you know, I don't, that's a really interesting question. That's a really interesting question, but I have not, I have, why is, I don't what's know. that doing? Feedback. Let's see, where is the oh, okay. okay. I've, I've, I've not encountered that one, and I feel like I've been around these DACA issues. It sometimes feels like full time for six years. Um, <laughs> um, I've not encountered that one. I will say that, you know, all of these visa issues are making many, many parts of this kind of the normal planning of this, you know, kind of cosmopolitan world that, that, many universities are part of, right? It makes it really complicated, right? Um, when the first travel ban came down and we had, at the University of Michigan, we had students from Iraq who said, I was planning on going home, should I go? You know, and the answer is, well, no. you might not get back in. Like, you know, you have to make that decision your own self, but FYI, you might not ever come back. And yet you don't want to panic people, the, the word ever. My colleagues at the university always tell me that I should never use the word ever. <laughs> um, uh, but, it, I mean, like, it's all really complicated, and, um, and it's not just DACA, it's all of it. I had a, a, a heart-rending conversation with a young woman who had just married a guy who is Iranian, and they were getting ready to do, you know, his green card petition as, as, um, uh, as her new spouse. And then came the travel ban, and in the first travel ban, it really wasn't clear whether that process was going to be allowed. And so they weren't sure if they could live here. And, it, you know, it's just, I mean, it wasn't just the match. It was the whole, the whole life that was rendered up in the air in a way, and I think that's true in a huge variety of ways throughout the Trump administration's approach to various visas. It's really not just DACA. It's like a huge number of statuses that are rendered iffy in ways that disrupt people's lives. And I would just add to that, it's not only what's already been done, but the fear of what's still coming. So after the first travel ban and even after the second travel ban, there's a lot of people not on the list of, uh, not from countries not on the list, who are nonetheless very, very fearful of traveling because who's to know who might get added to a list while they're gone? So it kind of permeates so many 
kind of aspects of people's lives that go beyond the immediate policy. And, and not just Muslim countries, right? There was right. talk for a while that maybe Venezuela might be added to right. the list, or was it Colombia? What was the other one? Uh, it was Venezuela. Uh, Guatemala. Was they it, were talking. I, I don't know Guatemala, but it Guatemala. was connected to the I, cartel. I, yeah, so there was there, but there was talk about, about Venezuela, and there was talk about another country, too, and the idea was that when you read what the criteria are, they actually meet those criteria for the, for the countries. And so, and maybe the Trump administration would have wanted to put some non-Muslim countries on that list. And, and so all of a sudden you began to get like people from those countries saying, I guess I better not go home because I might never come back. I, I want to add a little bit. So there is something that, that shows that we've had just in time reforms, but we've never really had a comprehensive solution. So what do I mean? So we talked earlier about Playa Levi Doe, right? And Playa Levi Doe essentially said that regardless of your status, K through 12, you're good to go. Um, okay, and then a question that was raised at the time is, okay, what are we gonna, what's gonna happen to these people once they're out of high school, right? And that was around the time where you started getting a movement, right, as these people are going through and now they're going to colleges, of big debates in many states about in-state tuition. They're like, okay, fine. We, and, and actually, be, be, even before the in-state tuition, I, I don't even recall, but there were many universities that started saying, oh, we will no longer check immigration status in who we enroll, right? So Plyler doesn't guarantee them education beyond the uh, 12th grade level, but then many universities kind of stepped in and did that, and then in-state tuition happened. Um, and then we had this sort of debate about dreamers, and then now we have, okay, now they're going to graduate from college, what are they going to do? And in some way, DACA was kind of just in time for that sort of cohort of individuals that came up during Plyler. Well, now DACA's uncertain, and I think the thinking was, once we got this far, that some comprehensive solution was going to happen, we wouldn't have to do these patchworks. Well, we're still in the patchwork, and I think what you've asked is, now that we have DACA, and these people are now going to graduate school or even going further on in their career where this uncertainty of renewal may dissuade certain employers or make it hard to find things or settle in a particular place, what do we do? Well, maybe we'll have another just-in-time solution. I don't know with this administration. But in some ways, this just suggests how we actually hadn't dealt with the problem that Plyler in some ways uh, was already thinking about. Last question. Well, this is more of a comment, I guess, than a question. This is more of a comment than a question. But uh, in the week or two after um, the travel ban was first announced, uh, at Fredonia, number, they held a sort of a forum, an informal forum for international students. And we have students from Taiwan and China and Japan and uh, uh, Sub-Sahara Africa and Middle East and you know, lots of different places. And their concerns included, I mean, could they go home? We had students from Taiwan wondering, could we go visit Niagara Falls? And it sounds kind of ridiculous, but American they were side. like, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's what, <laughs> well, kind of, but I think that it was, to me, really interesting to see the views of people, for students, for whom this was clearly not targeted to, but they were clearly felt threatened by it and really became uncertain of their status, mm -hmm. even though, you know, the, you wouldn't, you know, over, setting aside a student from, say, Saudi Arabia, which is not on the list, however, you know, is you know, majority Muslim. We're here, of course, because Robert Jackson lived his life and uh, did his work and wrote his words uh, on things that really mattered. And then they live on and they have a legacy and a kind of permanent teaching value. It struck me that you know, these four and Ted Shaw, who had to get on the road, um, are obviously living lives and engaging themselves and using their energies and their great skills on things that really matter. And that by participating in something like this, in addition to today, they've contributed education that will live on and echo and echo. Um, yes, the web, the internet, YouTube, uh, but also just for each of us in our next conversations, in our next semesters, in our next weeks on our jobs, and so forth. Um, I think this has been a tremendous contribution. So join me in thanking the group. We are adjourned and there are...